sustainability is all about the future. Will we have one we can live in? Are we living today in ways that will allow people in the future to live as well as we do? In a nutshell, that's what it means to be sustainable. I can remember 20 years ago a vigorous debate about these words sustainable and sustainability. Could they ever gain traction in educating the public about the planetary environmental emergency, which even then was beginning to look like it was going to require a lot of public education? And there were those in this debate who said, nah, no way. Sustainability, it sounds like Latin. It, um, it's got too many syllables. It's hard to pronounce. It's harder still to define. And a lot of these folks were pretty sure that sustainability as a word was going to disappear and end up in the, uh, dust, in the dustbin of semantic history. Well, they were wrong. They were way wrong. 20 years later, we're even less sustainable as a species than we were in the early 1990s. But we live in a cacophony of what I'm going to call sustainable. Or maybe more bluntly, sustainable. It's become more than anything a marketing term. It, it sells things. We're surrounded by a profusion of uh, sustainable cars, countertops, clothing. I'm wearing my sustainable socks right now. And I hope that you're wearing yours. A recent linguistic study looked at the exponential growth and the use of this word sustainable. And it projected that in less than a century, this once reviled word would become the only one used in the English language. <laughs> OK, this wasn't a real study. This is a cartoon. But the trend that it's talking about is real. So let's cut through the sustainable, the sustainable babble and ask, what does it really mean to be sustainable? Now, some experts, think, some experts think that there are lots of definitions. The National Research Council recently issued a report for the Environmental Protection Agency on the, the idea of sustainability as a possible regulatory concept. And amazingly, the report never once defined the word sustainability because or so I was told, it means so many different things to different people. Well, they got that right. There are people who listen, I think, to a little too much talk radio who believe that sustainability is a pot by the United Nations. UN helicopters are going to swarm over the country and they're going to unload blue helmeted troops in small towns across America who are going to enter homes and they're going to take out everyone's incandescent light bulbs. Whew. I've heard business people say a sustainable product is an environmental improvement on the standard model. But neither of these is what sustainability is. And there aren't lots of definitions. There's just one, although there are different ways to say it. Here's how I say it. Sustainability means never having to say you're sorry to the future. The essence of sustainability is that of, of, of true sustainability, true environmental sustainability, which is what I'm talking about today, is that human civilization can't afford to undercut the very conditions that make civilization possible. Obvious, right? But amazingly, that's exactly what we're doing right now faster all the time, actually, and in large part today because the understandable aspirations of nearly six billion people in developing countries for comfort and for affluence are starting to be met. That's a good thing, right? But it puts the one billion or more of us who live in the wealthier developed countries in something of a bind because who are we to deny to others what we're able to experience ourselves? And yet, right now, we're using the equivalent of one and a half Earths. We're consuming the equivalent of one and a half Earths. And we only have just one. 
that extra half Earth reflects our unsustainability. We're a little like Wiley Coyote in the old Roadrunner cartoons, remember him? The momentum of our mad dash through the desert has taken us right off the cliff and we're standing there in thin air, defying gravity while we try to figure out where we are. And when we do figure it out, suddenly at that moment, whoosh, splat. Right now, our growth in consumption, all our growth in consumption, in developed countries and in developing countries, wealthy and poor, is basically burning up resources that don't actually exist in any sustainable way. And that can't go on because the laws of physics and biology can't be repealed or amended no matter which politicians or which lobbyists are calling the shots in government. So we have to think differently about this. We really do have to think differently about this. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to look at some notes here. So maybe, just maybe, we're going to have to give up on the idea that we always have to grow. Alan Watts, a philosopher, once said, there's no use clinging to the rocks that are falling with you. And the rock of endless economic growth is beginning to look not so firmly anchored right now. Now, of course, for lots of people, there's a need, there's still a desperate need for some economic growth, some real economic growth. But on a full planet, for most of the rest of us, we're going to need to think about making room and learning how to share. Radical. But despite the marketing of sustainable you and sustainable me, you can't have sustainable socks when you don't have a sustainable society. Each of us, maybe we drove here today, maybe over the weekend we tucked into a nice beef barbecue. Each of us are adding just a little bit to the atmosphere's burden of carbon dioxide and other, it's equivalent in other heat trapping greenhouse gases. And this burden today is bigger than it's been in three million years. At this rate, if we don't change direction, we're gonna blow right through the 3.6 degree Fahrenheit zone of relative planet warming safety that scientists and even governments have agreed it's dangerous for us to exceed. And even if you leave climate change out of the picture altogether, and it's not out of the picture, we're using so much water that aquifers are falling around the world and some rivers no longer make it to the sea. 15% of our food production is based on the unsustainable use of water. And when that food production, when that unsustainable use of water, when that water is gone, that food is gone. And the story is similar with forests, with oceans, with wetlands, fisheries, the entire web of plant and animal life, the real world wide web that makes our own lives possible. You can't have sustainable socks when you don't have a sustainable society. Now none of this makes us bad people. We're not torturing anyone, most of us. We're just burning fossil fuels and using natural resources to uh, live well. The thing is, there are so many of us doing this on a finite planet that our amazing capacity to mobilize all these natural resources to improve our own well-being now is not just threatening the future, it's pummeling it, pow. And at this rate, future generations, dozens, hundreds of future generations 
are likely to look back at the early 21st century and they're going to say, those guys had all the knowledge right in front of them. And they could have acted. They could have spared us this harsh planet that we're trying to survive on, but they didn't. And if we know and we don't act, then I think that does make us bad people. So the question becomes, how can we know and what form does our action take? Well, obviously, there are millions of good people, some of them in this room, obviously, doing millions of good things to bring on true sustainability. And the rest of us, all of us, can pitch in and help. For starters, we can ignore sustainable babble. We can demand a real definition, a rigorous definition of what sustainability means, and we can set a high bar for how we apply this term. Here's what I mean by a high bar. When aquifers around the world are no longer falling, and when the only water we use is the water the sky rains down on us, that's sustainable. When greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere have peaked and they're actually beginning to ease down or at least stabilize at, at reasonable levels, that's sustainable. When we consume an ever decreasing fraction of the remaining non-renewable natural resources that we have so that future generations will always have some of these non-renewable resources to use themselves, that's sustainable. And when we return to nature's background rate of species extinction, talk about a high bar, that's sustainable. Now we can measure most of these things. We can track our progress toward true sustainability. And we can use that process to identify strategies and policies that will take us where we need to go. We need to get serious about our unsustainability because pretty soon it will be getting very serious about us. And unimaginable as it may be right now in today's political universe, we can and we have to push our political leaders and our representatives to put true sustainability at the center of how we govern ourselves. Now, positive action isn't as difficult as it may seem. We already have two strategies at hand that are already moving ahead in some places. And if these were applied fully at a global scale, they would go a long way toward the transition that's needed. One of them is called a carbon tax. Yep, a tax. It's not so sinister. It starts low and it moves gradually higher enough to spark the shift to carbon-free energy. This is a transition that's already poised to take off. And it would dampen high consumption generally, all without cutting economies off at the knees. If you don't like new taxes, make it revenue neutral. If you don't like regressive taxes, fairly distribute all the revenue as dividends to citizens or legal residents in any country. The other policy is called women's autonomy, self-determination. In a world in which every pregnancy is the outcome of a woman's intention to have a child, every pregnancy, population is very likely to either stabilize or perhaps gradually decline. And in a crowded planet with everyone having, I think, understandable aspirations for affluence, that's got to be a good thing. Finally, we need to get ready for the fact that we're already entering a planetary emergency that it's too late to completely prevent. So the air will be warmer. Storms will be stormier. Droughts will be drier. Forests, fisheries, fresh water, functioning ecosystems are all going to be a bit rarer. And food and energy costs are probably going to be higher, and that means that some people will be hungry, some of them will be impatient, and some of them are likely to act out. 
We need to inventory our values now and think now about how we're going to behave when times get worse. There's no technological fix for the fix we're in. There's just a human fix, and it's going to grow out of human values and human capabilities. The good news, to quote Eleanor Roosevelt, is that we're either going to die together or live together. And if we're going to live together, we're going to have to talk. It's exciting to live at a turning point in the human story. What's better still is to show up and pay attention at a time of rapid change, high hazard, and rich possibility. Being alive and present at this moment in time, you can lend your voice and lend your hands to the growing movement that's working to make sure that civilization and a livable planet endure. Thank you.